Okay. Well, hello everybody. I am excited to be popping on in here today for the last installment of our live stream series this month. And today we are going to be looking at the anxious avoidant trap and divine timing, how to find the lesson. So when we find ourselves in relationships that lead to significant heartbreak, I believe that there is an element of divine timing to it. So in the context of attachment styles, these sort of on again, off again, push pull relationships often evolve out of an anxious avoidant pairing or an anxious or an avoidant partner with a, a fearfully avoidant pairing or sometimes called disorganized, what I refer to as a spice of lifer. Okay. But this can result in what's called the anxious avoidant trap. And that is a circumstance where there's someone chasing down the other. And sometimes that's a perpetual state. Someone's always the runner. Someone's always the chaser or, and, or there's a second, let's say manifestation of this. And that is the runner turns around, starts to give a little bit back. And all of a sudden the chaser turns around and goes in the opposite direction, right? So either it's always going in one direction or we have this push pull on again, off again situation going on. Now there are a lot of therapist coaches and psychologists out there who talk about this as being a result of faulty wiring in the brain that brought you together, or that you are just responding to echoes of past trauma, and you're hoping to revise these old wounds by reliving them. And I would say that there is a lot of truth in both of those approaches. But I also think that there is a level of, let's call it divine timing in these situations. I believe that there is an aspect of our innermost spirit or source energy, or what I like to refer to as your essential self, that finds resonance with the energy of the partner that we have called in or that we have attracted. And so this aspect, I believe, has been unconsciously compelling us in these kind of mysterious ways up until this point, so that through this vehicle of the relationship, it can play itself out and be known on the stage, in the theater that is constructed between you and your partner. And so in this video, I'm going to share a bit of an example to illustrate this drama. And also, I want to pose a couple of questions to help you discover what I might call the lesson um, in this kind of relationship for you. The goal, of course, being that you don't have to relive it if you don't want to. Okay. So if you don't know, my name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am an author, educator, and licensed and board certified creative arts therapist. I've been in the field for about 14 years now, and I am just wild about helping adults with insecure attachments go from self-doubting to self-sovereign and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no do this using my method, which is called the McWilliam method. And it is comprised of three essential steps and processes. And that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experiential. So today, this video, we're focusing on a bit of cognitive reframing. Um, and if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I invite you to do so, to ring the bell to get notifications. And that way, you can come back and visit me in the future. I usually re release videos on uh, Mondays and Thursdays, and we do live stream series um, at the end of the month or throughout the month. So for today, as I said before, I think that there is an element of divine timing in these kinds of uh, catalytic breakups or experiences that we have. So for example, in my online community, we had uh, a member who shared that she was in fact in an anxious avoidant trap situation, kind of an on again, off again relationship. And her partner would do all sorts of annoying and confusing things. So I'm going to get real specific here, but I imagine that if you relate to this, there might be some let's say, equivalent scenarios that you have experienced. And if you have, I invite you to type that there in the comments um, or in the chat box if you are willing. So first, she had a partner. This is a heterosexual relationship. And she had a partner who would criticize her perfume and her outfits or the way that she presented herself and her attire. 
Um, he appeared to be unwilling to listen to her stories or what she wanted to talk about at the end of the day. Um, he would seem confused and irritated whenever she would try to show him pictures of things that she was interested in, like her pets or crafts. Um, he would pour out her favorite wine, claiming that it had gone bad when they had only just opened it the day before. He would check his phone in the middle of dinner to look at his favorite sports. He would discuss his family ad nauseum, but never inquire about her or her friends. Um, he might appear moody and curt or snide and make remarks like this one minute only to the wing in the opposite direction and be very kind and attentive the next. He might appear to be needlessly mysterious and disappear for weeks or months on end only to show up as if nothing, no time and space had happened and they could just pick up where they left off. He wouldn't want to discuss their cultural differences, even though it was obviously a strong influence for him and his family. And he felt that the family appeared to have kind of a clan mentality, a tribal mentality. And she would offer kind gestures to him. He would say things like, well, of course you would, instead of thank you. And so while she was able to identify these traits and behaviors as being very off-putting to her, okay, she couldn't quite explain why she kept going back to him, okay? So if we are to assume that there is some kind of divine spark in a relationship like this, and we're going to assume that because despite all these things that her conscious mind observed, that she found irritating, that upset her in the relationship, despite all of that, there was this powerful compulsion to keep going back. Because the only reason this partner really felt it was okay to come back like nothing had ever happened was because she allowed him to, right? So, so this is something that I reflected back to that member. And I felt like it was such a wonderful question and so brave to share that in the, in the group. And so I, and I, I'm sharing it here because I felt like this, probably many people can relate to this. And if you can, I invite you to give me a thumbs up or um, a like there so that I know I'm on the right track. But in, in reflecting on someone who behaves this way, okay, I would say that this person appears to be someone who's very confused about themselves and they're struggling to connect with others. And maybe they learned that competition and criticism is how you connect. There's a lot of people who don't know how to talk about feelings. And so they use things like sarcasm and competitiveness and criticism as a way to connect, but they call it witty banter or sarcasm, but it's actually a way of connecting, okay? He also seems to have poor boundaries. You know, the very specific examples that she was offering indicate to me that he was struggling with poor boundaries, okay, and was relying very heavily on an external environment for personal validation, the preoccupation with the clothing and the attire, right? Um, also appeared to be kind of ambivalent about love relationships, you know, taking a big break like that on inexplicably and then showing up expecting that it should just pick up where you left off. Also that he would talk ad nauseum about his family, but then not want to talk about the cultural implications of that. Right. So that there's as much as he may be invested in his family, there may be some ambivalence around what that investment actually means for him. OK. And perhaps because of familial and cultural influences and the differences that she identified. OK. Uh, you know, it may be that there are at other times things that are influencing him. So it, it suggests to me that there might be a form of enmeshment going on. And whenever there is an enmeshment going on, there's two conflicting things happening. A deep, deep sense of loyalty and obligation to the family, while at the same time, a need to rebel against it. Okay, so there's a constant ambivalence and friction going on around the idea of family, which extends to attachment relationships, right? That's gonna to extend to our attachment relationships, okay? Now, because of this, he probably feels very out of control of himself on the inside. So he tries to exert what control he can over whomever is willing to allow him to do it on the outside. OK, and so his behavior, the things that he's doing, the things that are being demonstrated here, they're more about him. They're more about 
what is going on inside of him. The confusion, the disarray, the, the enmeshment, the battling influences, all of that is going on inside of him. And he's trying to work it out. And you're kind of like getting caught in the crosshairs. Okay. So he probably feels very out of control of himself on the inside. So he tries to exert that control over, as I said before, whomever's letting him will allow him to do it on the outside. And so it's not, it's about him. It's not about you. <laughs> it's a cliche for a reason. Okay. Which leaves you feeling like I'm an afterthought because he's not fully present. He isn't. He can't be. He cannot be fully present. And that's why it's almost impossible to feel truly loved in a relationship like this unless we know ourselves first. Right? But I also believe that we tend to attract a perfect vibrational match for where we are in our own path and journey. And so it is worth it to ask ourselves in this circumstance some deeper questions. So questions like, do any of these characteristics apply to me? Perhaps do any of those characteristics apply to the, the woman who keeps going back to someone who treats her like this? So here are some questions I highly recommend that if you connect with this, that you ask yourself, how well do you know yourself? What passions do you have? Do you struggle with personal boundaries? Do you rely on an external partner for validation or to feel good about yourself and to determine what you should and should not be doing? Okay. Do you think that your partner should conform to what you believe is good behavior? Do you have a rigid standard of what is attractive in a partner? Do the opinions of your family and your friends or even a, you know, a YouTube channel like this or a private Facebook group like mine weigh heavily on you? Do you experience ambivalence or confusion when it comes to your romantic relationships and your partners? Do you think that your partner should be more direct in their communication? Right. This goes back to what she said, where uh, he wouldn't listen to the stories. Do you think it's OK to disappear and come back like nothing ever happened? Now, if you relate to this pattern, you must think it's OK because you accept them back. Right. Do you dismiss things that are important to your partner? And in, in this example, like his sports highlights, for example, as unimportant in the same way that he dismisses your taste in wine or outfits. Okay, so none of these questions are offered as a form of judgment, okay, but rather to help you understand the lesson and the gift that a relationship like this is really attempting to offer you, which is a giant road sign in the direction that you actually want to go. So I would, I would have you rephrase these questions into action steps now that you can take to return to your own center of power when it comes to relationships and inspire the commitment from a partner that you seek by first committing to yourself. Okay, so to the first, I commit to learning more about my passions, my passions, and doing that more often. I commit to learning more about my personal boundaries and advocating for them. I commit to valuing myself more and deprioritizing what other people think. I commit to realizing judgment and learning how to have compassion towards others. I commit to releasing judgment and learning how to be compassionate towards others, especially that which I don't understand, while embracing the dual nature of things. I commit to looking beyond surface level appearances when attempting to connect with people. I commit to clarifying the essence of what I desire in romantic relationship. I commit to being more emotionally honest and direct in my communication. I commit to saying no when my partner discards me and attempts to reenter my life with no explanation or acknowledgement of his absence. I commit to acknowledging and accepting that others may have different values than I do, but that doesn't make those values any less important to them 
any more so than mine are important to me, right? So once we commit to a process like this, you not only start to experience felt changes in your life, but you also start to attract and to be attracted to partners who have made similar commitments to themselves. And I would just have you imagine that there is a joyful type of secure relationship that evolves out of a connection between two people who are so committed to showing up in their fullest authenticity for each other in the relationship, right? So really the question more is, are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? And I think that if you can ask yourselves these questions on, on a real honest level, and then shift them towards statements of commitment, then you'll start to understand how you can start to show up for yourself in the relationship, as well as call in a partner who will show up for you. So um, I just want to, so with that, I just want to also add a reminder that this live stream is in promotion of my five-day live group coaching series, Five Days to Ignite Your Love Light. Tomorrow is the last day to enroll. Um, I haven't run a course like this in over a year. I haven't accepted new clients in over a year because I'm booked up. But because of the situation that we are in, I decided I would do an, an event like this. And I would have you consider it as like a crash course in learning how to identify your fears and your limiting beliefs and how to shed them so you can start opening up opportunities for experiencing the kind of love and partnership that you want. And it's a special event because I'm going to be having a guest presenter who is an experienced shaman as well come on and do a soul journey for us to open up the heart chakra. We're going to dive really deep into discussion and live Q&A in the Zoom space. Um, so if you've ever wanted to ask me questions uh, more personally, you can do that. And if you're interested, I've included some links to the info page in the caption of this video. Um, normally I charge $1,700 for a course like this, but I'm only charging $97 right now. And it's for more than five hours worth of coaching and discussion with me. So if that's what's something you're interested in, I invite you to check out the caption. Okay, so I wanna just acknowledge our chat box here. Um, we have a few minutes left here. We have... Um, Achilla, she, oh, she, Shelly in North Carolina. Thank you, she, her, thank you. Um, we have Gina, we have Andrea, we have Universal Sparkle, Todd Bridges, Roller Girl. Hi, World Roller Girl from Las Vegas. We have Chris, um, Jean. Thank you for joining me. We have Yoshi, Blue Morpho. We have, um, who else do we have? Bill. Thank you for joining me here today. I appreciate it. Who is, we've got, we've got, I'm screaming in two different places here today. Uh, we've got Anne, we've got Warren, we've got Jackie, we have Anna Maria, David. All right. Um, okay. So I wanted to just acknowledge, we've got a couple of questions popping up here. Maybe we can address a few of those. Um, Sometimes I go for these detached men because I admire that quality and I wish that I had it. Yes. And that kind of speaks to um, what we're talking about in that I think seeing a facet that for whatever reason we have discounted within our society. Um, and so, you know, you might ask yourself, why do you admire that? You know, why is it that you don't feel like you can inhabit that? Um, and usually if we're struggling with attachment stuff, it's because in our experience, the coping skills that we have developed, we've developed because they served us in some fashion. So on the backside of that, there's usually a story about unless I'm reaching for, right, unless I have this reaching for way of coping with things, then I'll never get what I want or need. Unless I message them, they'll never message me. And if they never message me, then what does that mean about me? What does that mean for my life? Well, what? And so a lot of these beliefs are subconscious. There are actually two types of limiting beliefs that we carry that are often subconscious and not really in our conscious awareness unless we go through a certain process of really digging into them. And, and those are specifically what I'm going to be talking about in the five days to ignite your love light um, coaching series. But it's a process of asking, like, let's say the right questions at the right time to be really to dig into how, what are we operating under? Like what constructs are we operating under? In attachment theory, they call them 
uh, working models, internal working models. But we have these coping skills for a reason, and we usually are attracted to partners that appear to be our opposite because they are expressing qualities that for whatever reason we have suppressed or denied or don't feel capable of within ourselves. And so in being with them, we feel more fully ourselves because we kind of allow those aspects of us to live out vicariously through them. And of course, if someone is, you mentioned someone who's more distant, so let's say that that's someone who's a rolling stone, what I call an avoidantly attached individual, they may be attracted to someone who's more, let's say, emotional or effusive or sweet or pleasing because in them, they have not allowed for those aspects because that was contrary to what was going to help them survive in an early situation or in another situation that was very impactful for them, most likely an attachment situation in childhood. So, so there is, a, we, we call it opposites attract because we think that's what it is, but the, the mechanisms that are actually attracting us, it's, it's really a case of like sees like. There's three things that are typically going on. And, and that is that we look to the external environment to validate something about us. We, we have a tendency to abandon ourselves in relationship, both anxious and avoidant people do this. Um, and we also struggle to, to connect with our, uh, an essential sense of self. It's a, attachment wounds are self wounds. Okay. So that leads to kind of behaviors that on the surface appear different, but underneath it all are actually the same energy. It's just repackaged in a different way. And that's really what this live stream was all about, was asking you questions to help you understand that you might be witnessing someone who struggles with boundaries, tends to be judgmental, um, gets distracted by things that, that they prioritize, can be dismissive, right? Those are dimensions that manifest in a variety of ways. In this example, it was someone who told her he didn't like what she was wearing, you know, um, would take long breaks, would uh, pour out the wine, would, you know, talk about the family, but then not want to talk about hers, not pay attention to things that she found important, right? And, but then if we ask the, if we ask her those questions, well, let's, let's t remove the specifics and look at the essence of what's going on. Do you struggle with boundaries? Do you sometimes judge people? Or is this whole question really a judgment? <laughs> is, you know, and, and noticing that it's, that's the energy that you're putting out. So that's the energy you're going to attract. But we get distracted by what I'm going to call the content of the discussion. We get distracted by the content of what is being manifested in the physical world of form. But, but that content is just evidence of an energetic process that's going on. Sometimes it's a record stuck on repeat, right? It's an energetic, some call it a block. Some people might call it, I don't know what they call it, arrestment, a developmental arrestment, if we're going to use psychological terms. But what it is, is it's, it's, the content is just evidence of a process. And the process is what you are attracting. Okay, and so I believe, to go back to the title of this live stream, that when you attract an anxious avoidant pairing, um, this is, uh, we could also call it a catalytic relationship. Some people might call it a soulmate or twin flame relationship. But when you attract a relationship that forces you to ask super deep questions about yourself, it's likely because they are expressing some facet of your divine being that is looking for expression. And if you want a relationship that is honest and authentic and deeply intimate. That's only possible. It's only possible when you know yourself to an authentic and honest degree. And so if you're not there yet, but you're not aware that you're not operating under that paradigm, these relationships will attract a partner that forces you to ask yourself these questions because now you're seeing yourself, it, it, now it's being projected into the stage on the world in front of you, right? So, so, so now you're being forced to ask yourself these questions. And if you can give yourself honest answers, now, now you have an opportunity to shift the way you're operating. You have an opportunity to move in the direction of, of generating an emotional vibration that is in alignment with the kind of partner that you want that will foster the type of expansive relationship that you actually want to experience, right? So, so this is the thing, unless you go through a process like that, 
you could be in the same room with someone who is a perfect match for the idea, ideal partner that you want, a perfect match for your soul's essence. But if you've got a lot of, of ego ideas about outcomes and you've got a lot of energetic, let's say blocks or patterns or internal working models and things like that, all of that cluttering up the space between your soul's essence and what you're what you interact with in the external world, you're gonna be, your vibe is gonna be dissonant. It's not gonna harmonize with that person. You could be in you could be sitting in the same room with the one and neither of you would recognize each other because you're not because you're not attuned to yourself, you're not going to be able to harmonize with them. Okay? So you won't recognize them. You wouldn't recognize them even if they're staring you in the face. Like this guy? This girl? Really? So so these relationships are are I believe what force us to take a personal inventory. And of course, nothing forces us to take a personal inventory like heartbreak, right? Um, so I see some resonance with the way the patterns go out in the feed here on YouTube. Um, are people doomed to tumultuous relationships? No, I mean, I, I think that's what I'm trying to offer here is that these tumultuous relationships are gifts. Their gifts. So long as we are able to do the cognitive reframing, like we've been demonstrating in this call, so that you can recognize the gift that it is, right? If if you cling hard and fast to ego attachments, right? If you cling hard and fast to the idea that none of this is me, it's all them, and there's nothing here for me to learn about myself. There's nothing here for me to ask about myself. I have no role or responsibility in how any of this played out, then it's likely, you know, the messenger is going to keep knocking because in essence, you're refusing to answer the door. So the messenger is going to keep knocking. Um, is the work you speak of something that can be done effectively in relationship or must you have the heartbreak and do it post relationship? I think that is something that uh, I don't think it's an either or circumstance. I think you could do this in the context of relationship and you could and you could do it out of outside of relationship. I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to that. I actually have a couple of videos on my YouTube channel that talk about do you have to be single in order to or do you have to I think it's something like um, can you can an avoidant become secure while single and it's, other questions like that. But in essence, it's really about your own temperament and it's really about what you know of yourself. So some people are able to do this kind of process in the context of relationship. Others, they've they've come from, let's say, more enmeshed family backgrounds. And so a process, a sense of individuality is very difficult to achieve in the context of relationship unless they've been doing their own inner work with a lot of platonic support, okay? So therapists, friends, support groups, things like that. Um, but some people, they cannot stand the external information without losing themselves and feeling obligated to the other. It's, it's, like, it's like they're trying to cross quicksand. And being in a relationship, it's like a constant, they they don't have the, they, their, their internal ego structure and their boundaries are, are so fragile that they're not able to be in that circumstance without getting sucked down. So part of it is knowing where are you in that process. It doesn't mean it's always going to be that way, but it just means that you may have a certain process for, for you that's going to require some distance from, let's say, romantic partnership before you feel like you've built up enough of that internal structure and foundation so that you can show up in a romantic context and feel like you don't have to abandon yourself at every request, right? Um, now others, it, it, it's, it really goes down to the intensity of, it, it, I'm a t I have taught theories of person personality development for like seven years. And a lot of this depends on the intensity of the stimulus you receive throughout your life and your own temperament. So, and it also has to do with the types of traumas you, you experience, developmental or incidental or chronic, um, and when that happened. So there are certain ages and phases of life where if you had a, 
you know, let's say they call it good enough. If you had a good enough family situation up until a certain age, then it's presumed that your inner life, your ego structures, the way your internal sense of self can develop enough of a solid foundation that the intensity with which you respond to a subsequent trauma um, affects you so much. Now, if you had a lot of early childhood development trauma, it's likely that you're going to have to work a little bit harder on building up those foundations, like the very foundation of your of your inner strength in a sense of resiliency, sense of self, ability to say no, ability to know when someone's crossing a boundary line with you, ability to um, discern what is an appropriate and an inappropriate uh, way to express myself in this situation. For example, am I emotionally dumping or am I emotionally leaking all over someone? Am I emotionally sort of emotionally crowding them out or am I just being vulnerable? And I think this is kind of an interest, important and interesting thing to explore because vulnerability is kind of a thing right now, you know, with Brenny Brown and all of that. And she's wonderful, but I, I don't know that she quite explains very well. Like, I I feel like I still have questions whenever I watch her about how she's how she's discerning, like, what's the difference between being vulnerable and being emotionally exposed? There's a difference. There's a difference between between being vulnerable and emotionally leaking all over everybody or emotionally crowding someone out because you haven't developed enough you know, flexible but firm boundaries around your own content, your own emotional energy to know when it's okay to express it honestly. What's the line between expressing emotion honestly versus being emotionally abusive, right? Kind of slapping someone in the face with your emotions. There's a difference. There is a difference. And and part of learning that is, is being able to uh, experientially and effectively feel out your boundaries. And it starts with the body because the body is the first organizer of experience. And this is why so much of us who struggle with attachment, insecure attachment wounding, have a very particular relationship to our bodies. So you'll often find there being an extreme people who just want to be um, held and hugged and squeezed and kissed um, and closeness and they want lots of sex and that's what makes them feel secure. And then you have, on the other hand, people who are hate massages, don't want to be touched. They're a little bit cold when it comes to sex. It's not a totally enjoyable experience for them. PDA is way off the table, right? Or, or, or they completely compartmentalize it. So maybe they're like, you know, really disinhibited with a sex partner, but that's all they're good for. And then everything else gets relegated to someone that they friend zoned right? But it's because we have this very particular relationship to the body, because the body is the first organizer of experience. And in our early attachment relationships, we we learned felt security by being held, by being touched gently and softly and lovingly, by being cooed at, right? But, and then and then by having a, a parent like play with us, kind of roughhouse with us a little bit, toss us up in the air, swing us around in a circle. So then we start to understand um, more active forms of movement. We start to understand more aggressive forms of physical contact and we experience it as being safe and fun and playful, not invasive, dangerous or violating, right? Now, if, we've, if, if our early experiences didn't afford us that, or we weren't touched, or we, or the touch that we did receive was being spanked or slapped, or shoved in a room and and left alone for hours on end, or, um, or we had you know sexual abuse situation, or you know all the way the body is interacted with an, at an early level is the way your boundaries will evolve into all facets of life. Um, and so, and so that's why in the way that I work, it's three steps. It's cognitive reframing, which is what we talked about here today by asking yourself certain questions to start to reframe the picture and it's body activation, because that's, that's where everything starts. The creative arts experientials becomes this playground between what you're consciously shifting around your perceptions and 
how now, how now is your body going to respond to those shifts? How now can the energy of the body start interacting with those shifts so that you not only spin around in insightful circles, but now you feel differently. So how do we get those two into conversation? Well, we externalize the conversation and we start playing with it using our creative sensibilities. And people sometimes get afraid when they hear the word creative. You don't have to be a Picasso. That's not what this is about. It's about your ability and agency to just make a mark on the page. That is, in its most basic form, the essence of your vital energy, your ability to create, right? We all have that, but it gets stomped out of us because we are trained to have a perpetual observance and obedience to whatever our external stimulation might be, right? So it's about learning how to live in two worlds, the inner and the outer, and to value and to foster each as 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 substantially as you can, right? So how is trauma defined? So trauma, there are a couple different forms of trauma and how they are discussed. So there's developmental trauma, um, which is sometimes referred to as little t traumas. If you want to learn more about that, you can look up Bessel Ventricle. He has a trauma institute in Boston. But basically traumas are, developmental traumas are chronic repetitive traumas that occur throughout a lifetime where there is repetitive um, dismissals or neglect or um, abuses of this, like disavowals of the self that are, that may fall under the guise of normal um, childhood experiences, but are actually quite traumatic to the child. Um, and trauma in and of itself is defined as the degree to the degree to helplessness and loss of control the person who is experiencing it um, undergoes. So for example, that's why you have you may have some people who experience like a natural disaster, for example, and only you know a percentage of them will struggle with PTSD, whereas the others are fine. They have a normal period of adjustment um, or grief. And then they continue living their lives. But then you have a percentage of people who experience that. And all of a sudden, they have all these symptoms and, and behaviors that impede their ability to function on a day to day basis. Okay. So, what goes into that? Why are some people perpetually traumatized? And why are some people resilient and able to process it and keep going in life? There's a gazillion factors that go into that, you know, um, and I talk a lot more about that question specifically in my 101 course on disorganized attachment 101, because fearful avoidance or disorganized attachment, what I call spice of life attachment style, is usually the result of trauma. And that can be uh, incidental trauma, like a, a big event that occurred, um, or it could be chronic, uh, like developmental trauma, a series of of traumas. And unfortunately, sometimes if we have incidents of trauma, there's also developmental trauma going on as well. So there's also, you know, uh, different things like that. But if you want to learn more about trauma, I recommend checking out Bessel van der Kolk. Um, I would also take a look at the way Dan Siegel talks about it. He, uh, Dan Siegel kind of created the field of interpersonal neurobiology. So I highly recommend checking out Dan Siegel, Pat Ogden. Um, those are some names that you might want to explore. Judith, Herm uh, Judith Herman wrote a book, um, Trauma and Recovery. So I hope that helps. Um, I did see one more question I will address here in the time we have left. I saw a question about to, talking about the concept of spiritual priming. Um, okay, so for those of you that haven't heard the topic of spiritual, of the topic of spiritual priming, Spiritual priming is basically when you learn a new doctrine. You learn a new doctrine and and you find your ego finds a way to take that doctrine and superimpose it on top of the way you have been operating thus far. And so now you find a new structure to justify the way you've always been operating. And, and it's, it's like a repackaging of the same energy. 
So, and then you treat that structure like what's called an auxiliary ego. So you don't operate, you don't make decisions based on a, a personal understanding of your own principles and moral code based on your own experience. Rather, you do things because so and because the higher power says I should, right? Well, how do you know that? How are you connecting to your higher power? Because I'm ascribing to this doctrine and that's what they say. But the deepest connection to your higher power is right here. So you are really the own, your own authority on the highest power. But the paradox is that in order to be in touch with your own highest power, you must surrender. <laughs> you must surrender. You must surrender your ego to your own highest power which is the idea that you your your highest power is unknowable in its entirety your highest power is unknowable in its entirety and of course we are all connected so your highest power is what we call source energy and some people will re refer to this as god and some people will refer to this as the higher power some people will refer to this to all that is right so this is the paradox that we talked more about yesterday um and i invite you to Oh no, um, two days ago. So I invite you to check that out. Um, when I talked about the fish in the ocean and that we are all paradoxically everything and yet we are nothing. We are all individual and yet we are all one. Um, so it's a paradoxical position, but to get back to the spiritual priming thing, basically it's like, let me give you a concrete example. So it's a repackaging of energy. So let's say that uh, we have a high powered lawyer we have, a, we have a cisgender woman, she's a high powered lawyer. She has spent the good part of her 20s and early 30s, um, and let's say 20s and 30s, working at a, a really high paying job. And then she decides she hits a wall, she's burned out, doesn't want to do it anymore. So she's like, you know what? I'm going to get spiritual. I'm going to start buying into all this new age spiritual stuff. So let me go, you know, I know what I, I know. I'm going to take all my hard earned cash and I'm going to take every yoga class within a five mile radius of my home. I'm only going to buy organic food. I'm, I'm going to learn how to cook everything gluten free and I'm going to attend every meditation retreat I can find. I'm going to do ayahuasca. I'm going to do, 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 right? So now she's, so instead of her Google calendar with her client list and meeting list in the morning, now she's got her, you know, her recyclable handwritten schedule <laughs> listing everything out in the same way. It's just different activities. So it looks like, oh, she's enlightened. <laughs> it looks like, oh, she's really digging in. She's doing the work. Is she? Is she really? Or is she just taking that energy and repackaging it to look like this? But it's actually the same energy, right? It's the same energy. It's just repackaged. And so you get people being like, I've been doing all the work. I've been doing everything right. Why isn't it working? Right? Because it's the same energy. You still perpetuating. Now, you might be a little closer. You might be a little closer because you're, you're asking yourself questions and you're making moves in different directions. I'm not saying that you haven't shifted anything. But it's still an approximation to the same kind of energy. So, so, so. So that's what I mean by spiritual priming. That that is an example of spiritual priming, right? You're you're now using a new construct to perpetuate the same underlying habit, right? Uh, so I hope that that makes sense. Um, I I've seen so many people go through my yoga studio doing this. Yeah, yeah, uh huh, yeah. Um, so I hope that that makes sense. You know. Um, that's just one example, but you, you'll find other examples, you know, and, and, and someone asked me a question recently, actually about medicines. I know I said ayahuasca um, as a peyote, things like that. Um, I think that 
I think that anything you try, anything you try in the external world, because you're trying to make a shift, right? The the important thing to acknowledge and to va validate, I guess, there would be that you've you've noticed something, and now you're trying to make a shift. And there's there's gonna there's that inner critic, there's that part of you that there's part of you that needs to follow an A, B, a to B equation that says what's the right move, what's the right thing, you know, and. Because you're asking yourself questions and you're ready to make a shift, you're starting to get in closer alignment with yourself. That's not a wrong thing. You are, you're inviting new possibilities in. You're inviting new, new, new opportunities in. And you are shifting something. You are doing something different. And that is gonna shift your energy. So I, I'm not setting up this example to make you beat yourself up yet again for not doing it right, <laughs> right? But but what I want to help you understand is that it's not what you're doing, it's your vibe while you're doing it, right? So you've got someone in that yoga class who, let's say that character that we just brought up as an example is doing yoga next to someone who is physically observably doing the exact same thing, doing Shavasana right next to her on the floor, but qualitatively experiencing that as a very different thing. Qualitatively, that behavior is moving energy through her body in a different way, right? The intention around it is so different. Um, and so it's something that you that you sink into and and it's not something it's not a light that you can switch on and off. Right. It's something that the, it reminds reminding me of a quote. It's a remind reminding me of a quote by C.S. Lewis. Um, I'm not going to remember the specific written material, but it was quote, it was a book about grief. And to paraphrase, he talks about how these types of transitions and transformations happen over time slowly and in a way that you barely notice when it happened. It's kind of like when you're sitting in a cold room and you feel cold, but there's an, a window and there's, you know, sunlight shining through the window. And over time, that sunlight warms the room. And before you realize it, you're comfortable. You're not cold and shivering anymore. But you don't realize when that happened. It wasn't a process that you had to effort. It wasn't an efforting. It wasn't um, something that you turned on or affected, right? It was it was a process, a slow warming that occurred beyond your conscious awareness. Um, so I don't want, I, I, I don't offer this example to, for people to beat themselves up, but rather just to be aware of, just to be aware of, it is a process that you're going to be um, engaged in. And, and a lot of times there's an aspect of that process that you're not going to have complete control and command over. But the practices that I teach you, like in my five-day coaching series, which, you know, I'm promoting here, it, it are practices that I have found helped me to be in deeper dialogue with myself that helped foster and create enough spaciousness in my inner space, let's say in my energetic body, for that kind of energy to start to relax a little bit. And it doesn't happen all at once. It happens over time. But you do have to treat it like a practice. You have to acknowledge your inner space, your spiritual self, as needing as much care and TLC and maintenance as your physical body. Your energetic body needs the same kind of care and maintenance in the way that you wake up every morning, you brush your teeth, you take a shower because you don't want your teeth to rot out of your head and you don't want to smell bad or get infections and rashes. So equally, meditating, being creative, activating your body, having a, a process of internal inquiry and dialogue is the equivalent for your inner life, is the equivalent for connecting with the essence of self, let's say, or source energy. Okay. So I think with that, we're, we've hit our one hour mark. So I think with that, we're going to end. Um, thank you so much for joining me here today. Again, if you are interested in participating in the live group coaching series, we're going to be doing next week. Um, enrollment ends tomorrow. So I invite you to click that link in the caption of the video to learn more. And um, I would love it if you could give me a thumbs up or a like just to let me know if you enjoyed this event or content like this. And we can create more of it. So thank you for joining me here today. I appreciate all of that.